D.Y., Derek Young, and Grant Flanders. I don't know if we've done a pod, just you and me. And if we have, it's been a long... Uh, for some reason, when it's just you, I want to like swear right now, but I can't. It's <laughs> been a long I'm, time. <laughs> I'm the one that usually swears on the podcast. Yeah, no Matt Hall today. He's, oh, I say today. Today is Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Today pod is, might release on Thursday. So that's how we usually do it. Yeah. Well, Matt's on K-Man right now. So. I know. So, you know. We can we can talk a little bit since he's gonna talk, talk for two hours straight. We can talk some trash on him. I know. I mean, that's what we all, because whenever it's he's always talking trash on you. I know. I listen. Not, to him. <laughs> I hear him. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no Matt Hall. It, it feels really, really. Uh, I'm relieved. It feels good. We got the the really smart football guy and the number two. Matt Hall's like a, a, a far like fifth or sixth on the. The KSO roster. <laughs> I didn't know we had a fourth. <laughs> no, I was kidding. Um, we do, but uh, but um, yeah. So first full week of like of media availabilities before the first football game for K State, which yeah. I game mean, week, how, yeah, yeah, game week, and like it's a lot of availability, man. And we're not complaining. It's 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 good stuff. We we got to talk to. Uh, like 12 players yesterday being there's more of that it, it felt like half the team yeah. showed, up, showed up on tuesday of the game week uh you know just what gonna be four days before they play against nichols uh, inside bill snyder family stadium on mm-hmm. saturday so yeah we got to talk to a lot of players got to talk to head coach chris Kleiman yep. as well and i know it's something we wanted to dive into we might as well now yeah. just cut c- kind of some of the big takeaways from that day and we some of it's already been on a site written in written form and in video form already. If you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, obviously, we'll get into it now too. And one of the big points was you know talk about Wayne Jones, the safety. And despite being a redshirt freshman, he's going to be a starter at uh, free safety, no strong safety. One of the safety yeah. spots <laughs> for Kansas State. Denzel Goolsby being being the other one, but they have not been reserved at all when they talk about Wayne. They've they've noted uh, re- repeatedly just how much he means to them. Um, and they talk to him like he's going to talk about him, like he's going to be one of their best players, mm-hmm. not just like someone that's, you know, starting at a necessity or someone that's going to be maybe going through, you know, a steep learning curve or, growing pains or anything they talk about him like he could be one of the top two or three players on this defense and while i always thought wayne jones would eventually become a starter at some point just hearing him talked about in that way is a little surprising and and i know a quote we want to add in here is Mm -hmm. just uh coach Kleiman talking about it and coach klanderman talking about wayne jones just how smart of a football player he is and the way that he can absorb information really because they said uh you know they're implementing a new defense uh on the Kansas State roster right now and and just to be blunt they think he knows it just as well as anyone if not more than everyone else so here's those quotes from uh coach Kleiman talking about how great Wayne Jones has been throughout the fall and learning this playbook knowing it better than anyone else and then hear from Wayne Jones right after that Matt asked him a few questions about Kleiman talking about uh the high praise I think Wayne might know as much about football as anybody we have on defense. And um, Wayne is somebody that jumped out to me right away in the, in the spring, That uh, a real cerebral guy that uh, just gets the game. He's one of those guys that uh, is a football junkie that understands it. And so uh, I think it'll help having Denzel that's played a bunch of football uh, maybe to, to calm his nerves a little bit or, or, or things. But from the standpoint of understanding what we're doing defensively, I think they're all pretty equal coming in because none of them knew what our systems were, were about. And Wayne's picked it up probably as well as anybody we have on defense. And uh, he'll be a leader for us back there. And that's something that uh, as a young player, you, you sometimes say, boy, I don't know if you want a young guy leading a back end, so to speak. This kid's got that. He's got that it factor. Wayne has that it factor, and uh, um, the players know it too. I mean, you see that kid flying around making plays. I, I expect a, a really big season out of Wayne. Film study. Uh, watch film every night, all night, yeah. uh, over and over again, uh, going over my notes that my coach tells me each practice. Um, that's really it, just film study. When did you feel like you were comfortable with this system? 
I feel like this this fall I feel real comfortable. Last spring uh, I wasn't as comfortable as now just because it was new to everybody, but now I just feel real comfortable. So, yeah, you heard from Coach Kleiman and Wayne Jones. That's going to be exciting stuff for the defensive backfield there. What else did you learn from Tuesday? I mean, obviously 12 players to go around. I know you got to talk to some and hear from Coach Kleiman. So tell me your thoughts. Yeah, I guess we can look a little bit more when it comes to the depth chart and a little bit of the pecking order at a few spots. And right now we still don't know who's going to be the backup quarterback. And mm -hmm. we had another media availability on the day we're recording this right now on Wednesday where we actually got to speak to uh, quarterback coach Colin Klein. And I still don't think we have any certainty at that spot. So they're going to they're gonna run out the clock on this one unless Courtney Messingham surprises us on Thursday uh, and, you know, shares who – who's going to be the number two quarterback, at least heading into the season opener. My guess, and it's a, probably a little bit of an educated guess, is it's probably going to be Nick Ost, but I don't. there's little, if any, separation yeah. between the two right now. How much of that goes into Nick Ost being in this, I mean, not in the system, but being around K-State for so long compared to Holcomb just a few years? And, I mean, obviously he's physically gifted, but Nick Ost, you know, he's been around and, and there's been not, high not, praise. Not, for, not much for He's been around one more year than Holcomb. That is true. He's only a sophomore. But he so. has had some high praise from from other coaches and players, um, Skylar Thompson being one as well. Yeah. Uh, and the, the way they talk about him is just being able to trust him um, and is loving his dedication, whether it be in the film room or just, you know, studying, mm -hmm. learning anything that, you know, that there is to learn. So, there is a lot of respect for Nick Oss. Now, the way that they describe his game or what kind of makes him be in the spot that he is in terms of battling for the back of quarterback spot sounds more probably like a game manager. And when it comes to Holcomb, and we kind of know what he is about because he mm -hmm. was, you know, a recruit that we got to see and we profiled and documented, you know, pretty on an in-depth level. We know that when it comes to him, it's probably more about the raw skills yeah. and the raw talent. So while they're battling for the back of quarterback spot, they're probably not much very, not much alike at all. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to another position that, I mean, could have some battles throughout the season um, when it comes to the running back position. James yeah. Gilbert, I mean, he's the number one guy right now. But According you talk to, to both, depth chart. Yeah, <laughs> you talked to both him and Jordan Brown on Tuesday. I mean, what did you get from talking with them? Uh, and, and it's probably – a culture that's probably been built by the assistant in that room, Brian Anderson, mm -hmm. but they both echo. And Harry Trotter said the same thing. We got to talk to yeah. him as well. And they all three, you know, and whenever they're available to the media, they all three talk about how important it is and how unselfish they are and how important it is to be unselfish. And that really who starts probably won't matter because they're all going to get, the, you know, their share, their reps, you know, their 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 number of snaps. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, while James Gilbert's number one on the depth chart, I'm not sure that means a whole lot right now. And to be honest, it probably doesn't. I don't think it does. Um, and the way that they plan to use him, it probably just depends on what play yeah. is called. You know, out of the gate. Um, if if I had to say who has the best odds at being that first running back used in the the season opener against Nichols. The one with the best odds is probably James Gilbert, but, mm -hmm. but trying to nail one down is it's a pretty difficult task to do at this point. And I'll just say this, and, and it's probably something that it would be a good topic to cover, you know, in in the final podcast before before Saturday. But I would imagine we see three or four different starting running backs this year. Yeah, I mean, I I think that could very well be the case. Um, do you have an idea of who might be like the goal line guy at this point, or is that going to really be? up in the air until we really see on game day, uh, that's going to be the guy who they put in there. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know what role they really will have for each one. I know that it seems like Gilbert and Trotter are a little bit more mm -hmm. alike than than those two are to Jordan Brown. So yeah. Jordan Brown's a little bit different. They call him a little bit more explosive, a little twitchier, and he's someone that's probably – their most dangerous threat in terms of the passing game out of the back in, out of the backfield, but yeah, goal line I don't know, but they, they they're starting to mention Tyler Burns a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that he'll play a lot in the beginning, but if there's ever you know a need to infuse a little uh, some more guys, 
which, you know, they have no problem doing when it comes to running back. He's probably one of their biggest ones or the biggest one that'll play this year, even if it's sparingly. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if that is a role that he could carve out. But if but if push comes to shove, I would guess maybe that's Gilbert's zone, at yeah. least to start. Um, I feel like you guys touched a lot. You and Matt touched a lot on offensive line in the video yesterday or you know, yesterday Ev- or two days ago, if you're hearing this on Thursday, talking about Evan Curl and such with that. So go go watch that video. You starting you left get guard. On that. He's starting left guard over Josh Revis. Is there anything else you want to add when it comes to that? I would just say that I've, some people are using it to kind of sound the alarm bells. Josh Revis played quite a bit of snaps last season. Yeah. He was really good. Mm-hmm. Well, I wouldn't. That's probably being a little too much hyperbole in that. He was he was fairly good. He mm-hmm. was very good for what you would expect out of a redshirt freshman starting on the offensive line. He got two starts last year, if I if I'm correct. And there were at times where he was probably one of the or maybe the best interior offensive lineman in portions of the season when some of the other guys were struggling. And, and it was an offensive line that that wasn't as cohesive last year and definitely had their struggles Mm -hmm. and he was you know more than adequate so for Evan Curl to kind of maybe lap him so to speak I think probably speaks volumes more about what Curl has done rather than what Rivas hasn't Um, my only hesitation and it's probably unfounded so take it for what it's worth is that and I and, and probably it's unfounded in two ways unfounded because they're, they're, you play the best five guys and mm-hmm. you don't look you don't look behind you you don't look past that and because these probably as even though they're going to be the five starters the five seniors are on the offensive line on this upcoming Saturday I don't think that th- these five will start every game that's unheard of mm-hmm. so it's probably not much of a concern but when you do start five seniors then you're giving yourself maybe a taller task the following season I think that's yeah. something to at least be weary of to an extent. We will get to wide receivers here in a second, but offensive line, I think I saw in the chat that you put that you think this is the strength of the offense. Am I wrong in saying that? When you have five seniors, yeah. it better be. That's the way I look at yeah. it, and especially when the three of them are returning starters mm-hmm. with Holtorf, Mitchell, and France, and they're not just returning starters. I think France, is, this will be his fourth year as a starter, and this will be Mitchell and Holtorf's third year as a starter, so they have a ton of snaps between them. Um, I mean, this could be a T. I mean, I what do they have? Eighty combined starts, uh, you know, combined. It, it's probably close to that or over that. It's probably way over that. Um, and then Kaltmeyer, who we probably overrate a little bit, just because we believe that we know what we're going to get from Nick Kaltmeyer. But even though we, the little we have seen him, he's been pretty good, yeah. especially against UCLA in the Cactus Bowl. Um, we still have only seen them only a little bit. So, but yeah, the way I look at it is if it's, if it's not the strength of your team, you're probably doing something wrong with starting five seniors. So if you have five seniors on your offensive line, it better be the strength of your team. Now let's move on to wide receiver to finish up, like talking about the offense and stuff. Like we talked to Jason Ray on Wednesday. Um, there was a little tidbit he gave you about, um, he doesn't really, he goes more with the flow than some of the other coaches go with. Um, as far as performance means a lot on the field with who he ends up going with week to week. Yeah. You know, some coaches, they'll, they'll have a good idea or a concrete idea of who they are going to play and when heading into a football game. And I think every coach probably has a plan to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, Coach Klanerman, you know, I asked him about, you know, the number of players he was hoping to play. And he said, you know, that he thinks they'll go three deep at safety and that they'll have two different nickels. Obviously, the safeties being Goolsby Jones yeah. and uh, Jonathan Alexander, and the nickels being John McPherson and Jonathan Durham. Uh, but when asking Coach Ray that, he thought that the way he would rotate things or uh, d- decide you know, to make any changes or how many you know players will see the field – uh, he said most of those things gets do get solved on Thursday and, and Friday, but he kind of leaves it a little bit of an open slate mm-hmm. that he he kind of lets game flow dictate you know what he thinks is probably best in certain situations. Whereas you know some coaches will be like, you know, you look at their you know notebook or yeah. you know for example, say well before the game these are my notes in this situation this is who I was going to play, mm-hmm. so. That's probably just to say, you know, Coach Ray, if he sees someone, sees Joshua Youngblood going there for three or four snaps and 
he's just absolutely balling. He's like, well, instead of looking back at the script and said, oh, I had him for five plays, I'm going to keep going with this yeah. guy because I want to keep feeding him. Absolutely. I mean, and then what could that mean for a guy like Malik Knowles who has high aspirations to be a number one guy, but right now sitting on the depth chart at number three, but maybe that doesn't matter much when, when a guy's philosophy at that position is like Ray's. Yeah. Uh, with, with his philosophy being what it is, you probably get on the field and you start performing. You're probably not mm-hmm. going to leave the field. Yeah. That's probably what it comes down to. Or, you know, obviously the same would be for practice. Mm-hmm. If you're out there doing what you're supposed to be doing and, and, you know, showing up and making plays, then you're probably going to, you know, get what you deserve in terms of, you know, all that. So, yeah, I think in terms of stars, it probably is going to be earned in practice just mm-hmm. like anything else. But when you get on the field, you better perform or, you know, you you know, you know, maybe you got a quick hook or, yeah. or maybe, you know, because I, I bet they still play upwards of five or six different receivers mm-hmm. on Saturday. Um, Dalton Sean, we'll get to a quote of his here in a second. But one more guy I want to bring up because I feel like didn't Kleiman bring up this guy in the press conference? And he I, he isn't talked about much amongst the media. But it seems like he might be making strides in practice and such as Chabaston Taylor. I mean, they know he's physically gifted, but obviously last year didn't see the field that much. I mean, what do you think you could see out of a guy like that? Yeah, he looks the part, and there's been, you know, a little bit behind the scenes said about him. So maybe he's on, you know, an upward trend. Um, I'd have to hear more to kind of believe in it all the way. I think he still has a little bit of ways to go, but. You know, when asked about, um, you know, if he's kind of in the mix Mm -hmm. to have any kind of rule and Coach Kleiman, I think, immediately said, you bet. Now, I don't know, you know, how big of a rule that is or how significant of a rule that is or if in the discussion still means maybe we'll play, maybe we'll not. I don't know. So it's I think that's still one of the things I think there's. As much as we say there's uncertainty at running back, I think there's just as much uncertainty, if not more, at wide receiver because at running back, we don't know what the rotation will look like, but we know who they will be. Mm-hmm. It, it's the you know the three we always talk about, and even maybe Tyler Burns and yeah. Joe Irvin. At receiver, we don't even know. I mean, you, we think we know with Dalton Schoen yep. and Malik Knowles will kind of be in the discussion, and maybe Joaquin Gill yep. if he's completely healthy. Those are the three that seem to be talked about the most after that i think it's you just it's it's such a such a mystery there's joshua young blood there's, he's talked about a bunch but also yeah he's so young so he's talked about a experience. bunch probably the most after the first three yeah. maybe more than a couple of those mm-hmm. three yeah but also not on the depth chart or even in the two deep at this point uh larry weber who hasn't been talked about a bunch but is on the two deep and all of a sudden just got awarded a scholarship mm-hmm. philip brooks who's starting to get talked about more got put on scholarship in the off season and then shavastin taylor who also was not on the two deep. So there's just like so much. I think on Saturday, everyone says, oh, we're going to learn the most here. Or we'll learn the most at this spot. I think that there's a position that we're going to learn the most about. It's going to be wide receiver. Yeah, I agree. Um, I guess let's get to a, I mean, it's a little, a little off topic, but it is from Dalton Schoen talking about the FCS and FBS levels of play. And Matt yeah. asked him an interesting question of, hey, I mean, like, do you really see much difference in a lower level FBS team and a high level FCS team when you come into play? Yeah, and for, and for, and for more more clarity on yeah. that, we we talked you know you know several times already in this podcast about Nichols being a season mm-hmm. opener. Obviously, an FCS program, one that beat KU last year, mm-hmm. uh, K State. You know, Coach yeah. Kleiman said it best. Probably should have lost to South Dakota last year. Absolutely. And one of the things that Dalton Schoen even said prior to this question was that he thinks part of the reason that they had trouble beating South Dakota last year is because they looked ahead of them. He said even in fall camp, they weren't just preparing for South Dakota. They were also preparing for Mississippi State in fall camp. So he says this this year it's just been all nickels all the way. But it kind of makes you wonder, you know, too, some of these FCS programs, are they starting to pose more of a challenge than some lower uh, FBS programs? Say like Kansas State the last two years. I think they've just out, absolutely destroyed both Charlotte and, and UTSA, University of Texas San Antonio. While they also destroyed Central Arkansas, it seems like they were a little bit more competitive. Mm-hmm. And then last year, you know, escaped Bill Snyder Family Stadium with a win over South Dakota. So Matt did ask, right? He asked yep. Dalton Schoen, is like, is it to a point now where these FCS programs pose more of a challenge than some of these lower level FBS teams? Like, are they actually better? 
So I thought it was an interesting answer and, and definitely a blunt and direct one from Dalton Schoen. Well, I definitely think the FCS teams are it's more of a trap game in a yeah. sense, you know, because I – I believe the past couple of years, at least the FCS teams we've played are honestly sometimes better than the mm -hmm. lower level FBS teams. So, but as a fan, everyone expects us to just go out there and kill the FCS teams when in reality, these are top 10 FCS teams we're playing every year. And they're really good football teams. You know, they're, I think Nichols went nine and four last year. They're a playoff team. They got a four year starter at quarterback. So they're a good football team. So obviously yeah, you can't overlook them and they are better than F some FBS teams. So we just got to prepare like we need to though. So, yeah, you heard Dalton Schoen there, but I, I do want to move on now to the defensive side of the ball. I feel like we just covered a bunch of offense. We started with defense, but now let's let's get back to the defensive side of the ball and let's start with the defensive line. Um, yeah. I guess let's start with tackles first before we get to the ends and then get to a Buddy White quote here in a second. But, I mean, what do you see from the defensive tackle spot? Obviously, Trey Deshaun is uh, going to be the guy there. Who else do you see filtering in and out? And how many guys do you see maybe week one? It might have been, in terms of starters, that list the when they, they released the two deep yeah. this past Tuesday, might have been the one surprise because I kind of guessed I I don't know about you but I I expected Joe Davies to be that starter next to Trey Deshaun but it was Jordan Mitty mm -hmm. uh, good for Jordan Mitty seems like he's made a lot of progress because last time we saw him I thought he was definitely someone probably a need for improvement um and the same for really be said about Joe Davies I thought they were a little weaker off the middle last year than they wanted to be so. A little bit of surprise there. Joe Davies will obviously provide depth, um, and so will Drew Wiley. He was also listed on too deep. Not listed on the too deep, but sounds like someone they want to count on this year as Eli Huggins. So mm -hmm. I think the story for the interior of the defensive line is are they really going to play five guys at defense? Not the restaurant, yeah. but five yeah. five guys at defensive tackle. Um, it, they talk like they definitely are going to. And it's one of those things where I probably should just listen and believe them because everything they say usually is the you know or has always come to fruition so far even though we're still, you know, mm -hmm. getting conditioned to believe what yeah. they're actually saying, so I should probably should believe it. But it's still hard to imagine there being a rotation of five different defensive tackles. Three of I mean, th there's usually three Four, I can see because that seems because then you just basically have two different defensive line units. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Five, it just seems like while you definitely will stay fresh doing that, I mean, but how much consistency or how much comfort and rhythm are, are you creating if you do that? And is rhythm important at all for an interior to its alignment? I don't know. Yeah, me neither, but um, that is something to think about. I mean, because you think freshness too could also play a big role when it comes to playing that many guys. But let's move to the outside guys. Obviously, you talk to – Buddy Wyatt today, he was there um, one, one, on Wednesday. One starting spot available. One yeah. starting spot available, and on that's something yeah, yeah. That, that Matt tried to clarify with him, and yes, yeah, still uh, not exactly sure who's going to start and who's going to keep that position, but here's a quote from Buddy Wyatt. I do not. I yeah. do not. They keep asking me, and I can tell them the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I haven't decided yet. So um, I expect both of them, like you said, to play, yeah. play an awful lot. Um, you know, and, and uh, whoever gets the nod, it's just they had a they had a better day than the other. Who knows? Yeah, it'll be Reggie Walker or Kyle Ball, and Buddy Wyatt knows his, doesn't know who he's going to go with. He doesn't know anything more than us right now. I know, <laughs> I know. That's that is interesting too. When you talk about a guy like Reggie Walker, he's he's on preseason lists every year. Um, but obviously, Wyatt Hubert has his spot completely solidified. It's funny, right? It is kind of funny because, <laughs> and not, not to detract or you know yeah. disrespect any of the the guys involved in this, but out of the three, like Kyle Ball probably has mm -hmm. a double digit number of starts. Reggie Walker probably has over has probably close to 25 starts, maybe uh -huh. more. Wyatt Hubert probably has two. <laughs> and Wyatt Hubert's the one that's, you know, leaps and bounds. And, and I don't disagree with yeah. it. It's it's definitely the right the right move and, and the accurate portrayal of these three. But it's just funny. Wyatt Hubert has far less experience than the two, and they both basically have started for almost two mm -hmm. seasons. Yet, you know, the starters – Wyatt Hubert, and we're not sure who the other guy is. I know. That is that is interesting, too. But, I mean, you also bring up a guy like Boom Massey, who has a lot of potential, too, and has, has seen some uh, seen some snaps in the in the past few years. I mean, what do you think of a guy like that, obviously, filling in for Wyatt Hubert once in a while? 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the, the same thing we talked about before. If they're honest and if they're completely genuine about how much they want to rotate the defensive line, then, then Boo Massey's going to get definitely mm-hmm. get his share of the snaps uh, as well. And I wonder if Spencer Trussell can get in at any moment as well. He's probably the fifth defensive end if I had to guess. So, uh, no, they love rotating. Um, it seems like at every position yeah. on their football team, which is – Will be a stark contrast to what you know we became accustomed to the past couple of seasons, but uh, they especially like to do it at defensive line, and it makes more sense to do it along the defensive line. No doubt, no doubt. Um, let's just keep going back in this defense. Linebacker, yeah, probably the weakest link maybe on the whole team right now. Uh, wouldn't call it weakest link, thinnest spot. Yeah, thin. yeah, yeah. Because you do have a, a guy like Elijah, Elijah Sullivan. Sullivan. Ball. He, yeah, he can ball. Daquan Patton, he looks the part, but obviously last year we didn't see much from him. Maybe he dealt with some injury issues here or there, but like, do you think he can turn it around and have a season to where I mean, if both are healthy, that we're looking at that spot as oh wait, maybe maybe it wasn't a weakness at all. Yeah, you would think that DeQuan Patton is certainly capable of growing significantly from where he was a season ago, mm-hmm. uh, and it's not to be completely critical of his performance, but it's just something that needs to be better if they want a a you know, a better result for this season. And that's as nicely as I can put it. He has to be better. He certainly knows that. And, uh, and the team certainly knows that, uh, Elijah Sullivan, he is when he plays has already proved how good he can be. Um, I mean, we know how good Justin Hughes is. We, we all believe how good Justin Hughes mm-hmm. is. Um, Justin Hughes was perhaps one more, you know, in the in the discussion for being the best defensive player on a team by the finish of last season. And then before his injury was considered the heart and soul of this team mm-hmm. and this defense by his head coach, Chris Kleiman, on multiple occasions. He was the vocal leader, the vocal guy. Um, they were going to give him all the keys to this team. And I know this is a different coaching staff, and I know Justin Hughes got a lot better. But to put that in perspective – Elijah Sullivan beat him out for a spot two years in a row. Mm-hmm. So they, I, that's not to take anything away from Justin Hughes. I just raved about him, you know? Yep. That's just putting it into perspective, if he stays healthy, how yep. good Elijah Sullivan can be. I guess that's the biggest question is if he can stay healthy. Obviously, he suffered a big one last year. and, and Yeah, two big ones. Yep. He, he, he had a lower body one that required surgery mm-hmm. that would have ended a season. He had an upper body one that required surgery that would have ended a season. So that's interesting. Um, sometimes I think we overreact a little bit, and I'm a victim of it or as guilty of it as anyone, and that we're like, oh, this guy is super injury prone. While they were those two injuries, I'm not sure he's had anything really significant outside of those mm-hmm. two. He played a lot in the season before. so Yeah, um, and then after, after guys like Elijah Sullivan, Daquan Patton, and, mm-hmm. and Daniel Green that's gotten a lot of hype. That's so your guy, right? I, I think all these guys are my I like all three of those guys right there. But <laughs> Linebackers those, are your kind of guy, yeah, no, that type of build. Absolutely. After those three guys, though, like, who are you looking at? That, I mean, well, Cody uh, Fletcher, yep. but he's injured right now, mm-hmm. and he'll miss the season opener. You hope it'll just be the season opener. I'd probably call him questionable for season two against uh that's bowling green right they play bowling green before mississippi yes, state i think yes yeah, so maybe fletcher will be back by then so that's probably your fourth guy and maybe fletcher gets on the field before daniel green too it'll depend on uh excuse me position daniel green is more of the backup at the inside and yeah. fletcher more of the backup on on the outside so and then what if you have to go past the those guys then you, you kind of get into some uncharted waters when you're going to just see faces you, you haven't seen before. Yeah. Uh, and certainly it could be anyone. Um, we hear Nick Allen the most. He's mm-hmm. a walk-on that played at Blue Valley Southwest High School in Kansas City Metro. So he's a redshirt freshman, but he is a walk-on. He's probably your fifth linebacker at the moment, which means you probably, uh, I, I would say, you haven't seen exactly what you need to see to know if, if anyone such as Levi Archer or Khalid Duke is really ready. Yeah. And Levi Archer, you know, gray shirted, so he's actually a true freshman still. Khalid Duke's a true freshman, so you don't need to expect a ton from them anyway. But um, perhaps one of them gets on special teams. Who knows? Yeah. Um, 
Let's move on to the defensive backfield. Uh, you did talk to Coach Klanderman today. First, yeah, I mean, you, you you had a few things to say from what he had to say. Do you have anything else that he said that you want to talk about? <laughs> I know, I just said, like, say, say, say three times in a row. That, that was... Uh, <laughs> say, said, say, said. Uh, certainly kind of wordy. <laughs> Uh, I mean, his guy's Wayne Jones for sure. Uh-huh. Uh, it'll be one of his starting safeties, along with Denzel Goolsby. We we asked him, you know, how many guys, and we kind of already touched on this before. Asked him how many guys, you know, he felt comfortable or was expecting to play on Saturday, and he said three. So you got your starters, Goolsby and Wayne Jones, and the primary backup for each spot, the free and the strong safety, is going to be Jonathan Alexander. Yeah, the the JUCO pickup and. A guy that also looks to part, and I'm sure, is a Flando guy yes. as as well. So. I feel like he could fill in a linebacker spot if he, he came in a pinch. He, too. Yeah, he's a big dude. I think he's a good player. Yeah. So I think that I feel I think they feel good about three different safeties. So I think that they had to play Jonathan Alexander. They seem confident that mm-hmm. he would be up to the task at this point. Um, he mentioned nickel. Uh, everyone knows Draw McPherson yes. at this point. You're starting nickel. Jonathan Durham will be the reserve that they feel confident in putting out there. So I think they got two guys that they feel confident. And tossing out there at this point. Uh, th- then we get to Van Malone's group, right? I know. Van Malone's group next. He wasn't made available to the media this week. I'm sure he'll be made available next week. But we did get to talk to a, one of the starters in Walter Neal this week. Yeah, he's good, isn't he? He is good. Man, he's one of the most fun to talk to. I think Matt will tell you that. I think anyone will. Yeah, Matt His is smile so infectious. Matt has a crush on him. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen Walter Neal like, not smile. I know. He's, he's such a bubbly guy. He's like guy. the Joker, man. He's just got it like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, he cut it on his face, man. <laughs> For real. But um, him and A.J. Parker obviously solidified as those two outside guys. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Walter Neal used to be the nickel, too. Yeah. So he's kind of moved over there, I think, because they felt better about the other options at nickel rather mm-hmm. than the other options at corner. I think they're probably going to be fine in the one-two spots. Excuse me. Uh, they're going to have to – I feel like they think they still need to get a little bit better behind the one and twos and and I think that's probably because they're so weary of the big 12 offenses yeah. throwing the ball around the yard even though I think they're going to see less of that now too because Dana Holgerson's not at West Virginia tossing the ball around the yard necessarily I think Neil Brown is not really mm-hmm. as much of an air raid guy if he is an air raid guy uh Matt Wells is you know n- not going to you know have the offense that Cliff Kingsbury had so It'll probably be a little bit less air rate of a, of a conference this year, but they still are putting a, a uh, what do I want to say putting a premium on their corner. So I think rather th- than us saying, "Hey, remember, we're really concerned about hey corners three, four, and five, It's Kansas State and this new coaching staff, especially on the defensive side of the ball, probably just lifting up the expectations and demands for what they mm-hmm. want their corners to be. To now, it's a little bit tougher to reach because they know like this conference this is probably on defense where we need to be our best no doubt and i think having a coach like chris Kleiman and and two guys and and van malone and klanderman back there to uh to coach i think is is a big positive for them but let's say uh you see oklahoma go five wide out what do you see after aj parker Walter Neal. I mean, I'm pretty confident in saying you're going to see Kiwi on McGee. McGee probably is that third guy. I mean, who? Yeah, McGee, McGee's yeah. probably the third guy, and then then you're looking to Darrell Patterson mm-hmm. and Lance Robinson. A little nugget I could throw in here too is we've been told by Coach Kleiman a few of the true freshmen that'll play. We probably should touch on true freshmen yeah, in general for anyway. Sure. Um, and a few of those obviously being Joshua Youngblood at uh-huh. receiver, um, Jack Stineen yep. at, at fullback. Yep. Probably Joe Irvin and running back, yep. and we've already talked about Irvin as well. And I think another one, from the sound of it, you know, me kind of talking to people around the program, in the program, kind of what to expect. And I think Logan Wilson at corner has a chance to see the field on Saturday. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm always big on Logan Wilson. I think he's going to be a good player for K State. But I mean, shoot, we just covered like. Basically, I feel like basically a preseason pod right there covering the whole entire team. A little bit, yeah, yeah. and and probably wasn't <laughs> our, our <laughs> intention to do so, but when you get as much media availability yeah. as we've gotten on both sides of the ball, I mean, talk I mean, we've talked to, I think, 15 players and, <laughs> and, and what, five coaches in mm-hmm. the past two days, so you can, you just, you get a perfect kind of picture 
a, a little bit of what to expect Absolutely. when they take the field on Saturday. And with that being said, there's still some mystery, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we still don't know who the heck's going to play at wide receiver and how much. We we know who's going to play a running back, but we don't know how much. We don't know who's going to start a defensive end. So there's still some things to look forward to, and and that we probably won't have a, you know, a conclusion on in, until kickoff. Yep. So I guess now it's time to get into the fact, hey, subscribe to our website. Um, KStateOnline.com is our website. Is our website. <laughs> Check out the message board. See everything that DY does football recruiting-wise. It's it's all – it's all you got to go behind the paywall for all that juicy info. It's not going to be all on here on the podcast, but it's all really good stuff that is going to keep you updated all the time. Message boards, uh, stories, and it's going to be a fun season. And if you're listening – to us right now on Thursday, we'll probably be on right. our way or about to be on our way to the Omaha area of the state of Nebraska. So we're gonna be checking out tight end commit Will Swanson and his season opener at La Vista South. Yep. Host La Vista High. So or you know, they also call it Papio South and mm. Papio. So yeah, we'll pop eyes is what I'm thinking. And about. we're going to pop eyes on our way I'm there. Scared. We're not Unfortunately, see it. Oh. I think the chicken sandwich is gone. Which is so stupid. Gosh, I mean, it better be in Manhattan in September, like they say. I'm going to be livid. There's a printed out sign on Popeyes' menu saying it'll be there in September. For those a little surprised, uh, Flano is a huge stand for Popeyes. Oh my gosh! And 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 if you and now now I hear about this this sandwich that I haven't even tried yet. It's it's irking me, like, but I'm still eating Popeyes. I'll go there and see the sign still, and then say I might as well get a a twenty piece. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, should be fun up in Nebraska. Last salesman thing I want to say, um, for subscription wise, this one's free. Subscribe to our YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, little bottom right hand corner, you can find a little subscribe button. Go there, subscribe to that. That helps our business. We make money through that and stuff. And I mean, it also keep you updated whenever we put a video up. If you want to hit the uh, notification thing up at the top right hand corner, I think is where it's at. Um, and then last thing is Tallgrass Tap House, Harry's, and Bourbon and Baker. All three of those places uh, they sponsor this this podcast. And every Friday night, so starting this Friday night at six thirty, come to Tallgrass Tap House. You'll see us there. The crew, the whole crew there. I'm sure there's gonna be tons of dudes. <laughs> in, in tall, <laughs> better come <laughs> in tall grass gonna be a great time we're gonna record our first uh preview podcast for the nickels game i uh, love seeing it make a dy laugh over there um so come to that yeah check us out uh you, you, if you want to get on the podcast, we'll love to have your voice on there. If you don't, that's fine. We'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah. It's all great. Just come hang out, listen to the pod, have some food, have some drinks, whatever. Tallgrass is a really fun place. It is. That's on Friday night. Mm-hmm. Don't exactly remember what time it 630. is. 6.30. 6.30. Yeah, Plato's is on it. And then the following day, Saturday, at 2 o'clock is Powercat Game Day. Yep. Matt Hall will be on yes. that with John Kurtz and that crew. Listen so to that. Go see that as it's, well. It's a good time, too. It's not like an 11 o'clock game where he'll be there at 7 a.m. Still say you should listen to that, too. But, man, this is the perfect time. 2 o'clock, you'll, you'll probably be cracking open some beers, sitting on your front lawn or whatever, or, or tailgating <laughs> something. <laughs> sitting on the front. <laughs> <laughs> Sit on her lawn. All right. We better cap this one better, off we before we say anything uh, else, silly. <laughs> so, Flando at KSO, Oof. what do we say? Tell your friends. <laughs>